Hey everyone, it's Frank and Suze here from Ephemera Terrariums and Plant Crab. Terrariums, aren't those from the 70s? Yeah, my grandma used to have one. What are they? Where do they come from? And why are they everywhere now? So many questions, and we are here to answer them with our History of the Terrarium. These popular plant homes have hit a boom in recent years, but have actually been around for maybe longer than you think. It's crazy to think of how a simple box changed plants forever, making it the greatest invention in garden history. That's crazy. The discovery of the modern day terrarium was an accident made almost 200 years ago. And it led to way more than just plant-based decor. Dr. Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward was a London physician by day, but in his spare time, he was a nature enthusiast. Okay, wait, check this out. He's got plants in the background here, and look, a terrarium beside him in the picture. When he was 13 years old, he thought he wanted to be a sailor. Look at these cool sailors right here. Yeah. So his dad sent him on his first voyage to Jamaica. Seeing the lush flora and foliage of the tropics began his fascination and obsession, quite frankly, with plants, especially ferns and palms. He got bit by the plant bug. I got bit by the plant bug. Me too. Fast forward a few decades, so Ward's this doctor, right, that dabbles in botany, and he's obsessed with ferns. In the mornings, he would garden, and then in the afternoon, see his patients. One of the earliest object of my ambition was to possess an old wall covered with ferns and moss. How was that accent? (laughs) (laughs) And after multiple attempts and failures to propagate ferns at his home in London, he pretty much gave up. Actually, he did make that fern wall and even put a pipe along the top that trickled water down the rocks like a mini grotto in his backyard. But that still didn't work. They totally all died. Oh, man. So let's talk a little bit about why ferns couldn't grow in London in the 1800s. First off, homes are just colder back in the day. Drafty, if you will. And they're, you know, rough heating and cooling systems. It's not like a gentle two degree increase in temperature. If you're cold, it's like fire on or fire off. But most importantly, we are in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, right? So we've got furnaces and factories making England's air totally filthy and unfit to breathe. With literal black ash circulating in the air from the enormous amounts of coal burning. And in the homes, too. It's not just dangerous for plants, but for humans as well. Think of the asthmatics. In the summer of 1829, with scant forest outside his home, Ward finds a sphinx moth chrysalis in his backyard, and took it with a scoop of soil and put it in a glass bottle. Okay, so this is not the little moth pupa, but it's nice to have a visual, right? Yeah, totally. In watching the bottle from day to day, I observed that the moisture, which during the heat of the day arose from the soil, condensed on the surface of the glass and returned from whence it came, thus keeping the earth always in the same degree of humidity, end quote. That was Susan's ward voice again. (laughs) Something magical appeared just before the moth hatched. A blade of grass popped up with a little fern frond. A fern, he exclaimed. Possibly a lost fern spore left in his backyard soil from a failed attempt at growing the previous year, you think? It's a possibility. I could not be but struck with the circumstance of one of the very tribe of plants, the fern, which I had for years fruitlessly attempted to cultivate, coming up spontaneously in such a situation. Side note, aren't ferns kind of romantic feeling? They really have captivated humans throughout history, you know. There's more about ferns towards the end of this video. And how Nate Ward over here, through his fascination, basically brought these plants into the light, so to speak. Ward placed the bottle terrarium in a north-facing window just outside his study, didn't touch it, or water it. He observed. The continued exhalation from the plants ensuring a constant moist atmosphere. And guess what? They continue to thrive for four years. Now, that is a low maintenance plant. Listen up all you plant killers out there. Four years, no care, no water. Now before this accidental experiment, it was believed that plants could not survive without air or ventilation. After this, Dr. Ward had large glass boxes constructed with the hardest wood so that a tight seal would prevent anything from coming in or going out, including air or water. 
The sealed box diffused drafts and abrupt changes in temperature, but still let in light. Hold up. This is one of the cases that comes later when he starts shipping plants. Shipping plants? Yes. But these ones he put all over his home, in his yard, and including on his roof. He experimented on different varieties of ferns and other blooming plants and growing his personal plant collection. And this is a drawing of his actual greenhouse. Visitors called his home, quote, an extravagant display of city gardening under glass, end quote, with terrariums in every corner of his home. So see, here's the crazy thing. Glass containers, greenhouses, these all existed before Ward came along, but never on a miniature scale like a terrarium. So then, in 1833, Dr. Ward conducted a near two-year experiment where he shipped these large wooden glass boxes filled with ferns, two of them, on a voyage to Sydney, Australia, strapped to the deck of a boat for about eight months. Where they endured intense weather and storms, including temperatures as low as negative four degrees with a foot of snow on deck, and as hot as 104 degrees. Now, side note. Plants shipped by boat prior to this only had a 5% survival rate. They were packed in crates and either stashed below deck where they did not get enough sun, or above deck where they were exposed to the weather and salty ocean spray, which made quick work of them. You think those cabin boys knew how to water and care for those delicate plants? Yeah. <sighs> right? Sometimes a gardener was deployed with the cargo, but some overseas trips lasted close to a year. To transport seeds, which had better success rate but not by much, and you still had to grow the plants, they would dip the seeds in beeswax and store in honey jars, or the seeds were placed in silk-lined tin canisters. But the seeds still had pests and rot over those long voyages. Now back towards globetrotting mini greenhouses. Not only did the plants make it to Sydney, but his colleagues packed it back up with Australian ferns and sent it back to London in... 1835 with huge success. And towards extreme delight. Through the shipping method, it is said that over the years, Ward had collected over 25,000 specimens of plants. The name terrarium, terra meaning earth, and rium meaning place or location, which directly translates to place of earth, was not used until later in the 19th century. Until then, terrariums were aptly called Wardian cases. Once word got out that 95% of plants shipped in Wardian cases can survive in near perfect condition, plant exploration, transportation, and cultivation exploded. Especially of exotic, never before seen flora, fruits, and other delicate species that couldn't survive before in London's harsh pollution. A new global plant based industry was created. It also led to the mass cultivation of the Chinese tea plant in India, the Chinese banana in Fiji, and Brazil's rubber tree in Sri Lanka. Ornamental plant growers popped up all over Europe and America, and this intercontinental exchange of local plant life gave way to the variety we see today. Now, just to give you an idea, the Kew Gardens, the famous Royal Botanical Garden during this time, acquired more plants in this 15-year period than in the past 100 years before that. Wow. Okay, so we also need to say here, let's be honest, this created some serious issues, especially for this plant here, including botanical espionage. Not to mention pest spreading issues. And plant hunter issues. But that's a whole other story. Stay tuned for a new video coming out about the greatest plant theft of all time, brought on by the invention of terrariums. And let us know in the comments if you want to hear more about plant hunters. Yes. After Nathaniel Ward published his pamphlet called The Growth of Plants Without Exposure to Air, he then published his book On the Growth of Plants in Closely Glazed Cases in 1842. That's when Wardian cases took off in the home. There was now a Wardian case in every Victorian parlor in London, and they took off across the pond in America as well. Plants like ferns exploded in popularity. Rich Victorian England fueled the market for exotic plants. They couldn't get enough. 
So first it was shipping the plants from these remote tropical places to botanical gardens like the Kew Garden or even universities. But now the average Joe could commission plant expeditions, sometimes by themselves as amateurs or with plant hunters, like this famous plant hunter. Joseph Dalton Hooker, son to William Jackson Hooker, both worked as the director at Kew Gardens for decades. Hooker Jr.'s BFF is Charles Darwin, FYI. Really? Also, rare plant auctions were held in the cities, and catalogs produced where you can now shop for exotic plants from the comfort of home. Basically, terrariums brought life and fresh green plants into the home and was a symbol of wealth and luxury. Not saying Victorian homes were drab, but, you know, a live plant really does wonders to a space. Oh, look at this one here. They're starting to get really fancy with like the fern at the top and the fish down below. Do you see that? So this one is the combination of land and sea, also called polludarium. Cool, eh? So now, Ward was hugely popular in botanical circles. Yeah, he was like a botanical celebrity at this point. He was having microscope soirees at his home, parties where observation via microscope was the entertainment. Mm -hmm. And he had people over all the time. Here's another fern party. Yeah, we got the little mischievous girl on the right side. Looks like Ward's spitting some game over in that other corner, too. All right, so random fun bit. Ward's colleague and fellow botanist architect, Joseph Paxton, who was famous for growing a flower. It was a really big flower. Really big. Built a gigantic glass hothouse. Basically, the biggest greenhouse anyone had ever seen. He called it Crystal Palace, and it was where the Great Exhibition of 1851 was held. This gigantic terrarium was built in eight months, under budget, even after they had to add this vaulted ceiling addition to accommodate these giant elm trees. See, it was a terrarium. It also featured as many as 14,000 exhibits, including the Jacquard Loom, an envelope machine, the precursor to the fax machine, and the biggest known diamond the world had seen at that time. And famous attendees, including Charles Darwin, of course, Karl Marx, Samuel Colt, who did demos of his revolvers, Charles Dixon, and Lewis Carroll. I said his name wrong. Dickens. Dickens. Fully lit party, though. <laughs> and good old Ward was one of those exhibitors where he featured one of his terrariums that he hadn't opened or watered in 18 years. So that means it was one of the first ones he ever started. Totally. So actually, really quick side note here, there was this guy who made a terrarium in the 60s, and he last watered it in 1972 and sealed it, and as of 2013, it was still alive. Super cool. But anyways, the Crystal Palace also featured a fernery, another huge attraction, of course, because ferns are becoming huge at this time. Now, this is not the fernery, but this is what a fernery looks like. Fern collecting was advertised as a sign of intelligence and good morals, and the hobby could help with mental illness and boredom. It was one of those rare hobbies that rich, poor, men and women were all equally enthusiastic about. Fern motifs started popping up on everything from fashion, to greeting cards, to toothpaste advertisements, teapots, and sets. All this botanical madness created an actual fern, fern craze, craze, which lasted about 50 years. And was then followed by the orchid, orchid craze. craze, and so on. Check out this orchid hunter dangling from the cliffside. <laughs> so, as time went on and decades passed, there were world wars, the Great Depression, terrariums kind of lost their luster, and people didn't really have the time or money to take care of ornamental plants in the home. In America, FDR was a lover of nature and pushed for conservation and the creation of national parks. People's awareness in the 60s and the quote-unquote getting back to nature really took off, and then in the 70s, particularly 1973, it totally exploded with terrariums in every home. These are some terrarium books from the 70s, part of our personal collection. Check them out. These are full of time-tested techniques and chock full of style as well. From the discovery of terrariums came the vivarium, which is a terrarium for an animal like a lizard or a turtle. Vivariums are meant to match the animal's native environment using the correct plants and terrain. 
Now, by the 80s and 90s, malls and even amusement parks had really elaborate vivariums. And zoos had finally switched over to vivariums as well, because, you know, before they just kept animals in simple metal cages. Total bummer. Bummer. Today's terrarium fad follows another movement to get back to nature, and probably comes from people moving into big cities where view of or access to nature is fewer and far between. As population densities increase, more people opt to living without a yard. Now, terrariums are great for anybody who travels a lot or just forget to water their plants. Terrariums kind of take care of themselves, right? Totally do. Ephemera Terrariums was started in 2014. We are a plant shop that specializes in teaching folks all about terrariums and other fun plant crafts. Check out our social media and our website. All the links in the description below. The next time you see a plant in glass, remember, the variety of fruits and vegetables and houseplants that you see today can all be traced back to the discovery of terrariums. So, that's the history of the terrarium. I hope yep. your plants at home are doing great. Hope your terrariums are doing awesome. Thanks for spending the time with us. Don't forget to like, like and, and subscribe, subscribe for more plant videos later. Bye. Bye.